Good afternoon and welcome to uh, Vincent's uh, webinar for today. It's a guide to managing the diversity of computer devices and online storage uh, by me, Dan Haynes. I'm a director here at Vincent's, so thanks for joining us. Um, it's a very uh, complicated title for what we're talking about, which is essentially uh, the cloud, uh, how we're connecting to the cloud, uh, what devices we have to connect to the cloud. Um, we have found through our client base that this is something that um, people perhaps are already moving towards the cloud, perhaps you're already using it and not sure how it works, or perhaps your employees are recommending it too. Um, and we would like to um, provide some information about it and how we interact with it and uh, what it all means. So um, the objectives today are what is the cloud, um, why should you care about it, obviously. What are the personal cloud storage solutions that you might have come across and how do they relate to what the commercial cloud solutions are? Um, we use Dropbox as an example of that. It's just something that we have standardized on here at Vincent's at the moment. Um, so we can go through some examples of that, of how we use it and why we use it. Um, we look at a lot of the questions that I get as a forensic person, as a computer forensic professional, is how does the iCloud work? Uh, how does it interact with all of my devices, my Apple iPhone and my laptop? I've started getting text messages on my MacBook. I don't know why. Why is this happening? How can this happen? So we can talk about all of those things as well. Um, in the context of Apple, given that that's a fairly popular platform, and it's a good example of how the cloud relates to um, users and how that relates to commercial solutions with regards to the cloud. I understand at the end of this session uh, you can provide some questions or if you wanted to uh, email them to me it, at Vincent's is fine, there's an address at the end, there's also we have the social media accounts so Facebook and, and Twitter so feel free to um, access those um, social media accounts on the cloud. All right. So why are we talking about this? Well information production today involves perfect copies. It involves perfect copies of perfect copies and endless copies of copies. So essentially what we're talking about is that the transfer of information is not only free but also um, it doesn't affect our original document. So we can transfer a copy of a document and it's a perfect copy of the one that we have. So no longer do we have um, paper originals hiding away in a drawer or share certificates or anything like that. We just send a copy to our broker or send a copy to our lawyer or to our accountant and it's a perfect copy. It doesn't degrade the copy that we have. Um, so information is eminently shareable. We can make new information from old information and there's no degradation. So that's essentially what brings us to the point we're at today where digital information is hugely shareable. Cloud storage. What are we talking about with cloud storage? So we can copy things, share things, send things, keep copies, send perfect copies. There are now over 10 billion devices connected to the internet. And one of the scariest aspects of that fact is that uh, we're told by researchers, Gartner Research, people like that, that 90% of the physical objects that may one day join the network, join the net, are still unconnected. So we have a very, very long way to go before um, this uh, journey that we're on is even close to being complete. So um, at the moment there are something like close to 2 billion smartphones in the world. Um, China is number one for smartphones. US is number two, Russia, uh, sorry India is number three, Japan is number four and Russia is number five. So um, it's certainly the way things are going. So what is the cloud? Why are we all connecting to the cloud? There's a lot of confusion about it. Essentially the term the cloud was given um, to this type of uh, data access and data transfer because the cloud is always moving, it's always getting bigger and smaller. Sometimes um, it's here, sometimes it's over there uh, and it changes. It's fairly nebulous. The metaphor for that being that your data which might be stored on the cloud can be on a server uh, here in Australia. Um, it can be the next day or the next week on a server in Hong Kong. A week after that it might be on a server in London or in Seattle. It's always moving depending on uh, your provider and where your data is located. So it's web-based. What does that mean? Well essentially you need 
the internet to connect to the cloud. Um, gone are the days where we all had uh, generic PCs with very large hard drives and we stored copies of all of our data on a computer in our office or in an IT room um, back in the day when nobody had the internet. Today, almost in terms of a, a modern society, making a broad statement, but you could say that perhaps um, the internet is a very common place in the workplace. It's very common at home. It's very common on your smartphone. So um, the reason that we're driving towards this data sharing is that we have a, a desire to have more storage and longer battery life. And that's why we're being driven to the cloud. Because your computers are not the ones storing the data. Your data is being stored on the cloud, which means that you don't need a large hard drive in your tablet computer. You can have a bigger battery and it will last longer. So that device becomes more desirable over someone else's. Your computers are not the ones doing the work, meaning they're not having to process emails constantly. They're not having to store and reconfigure and refile documents all the time. Given that the processor load is hopefully lighter, um, your battery will last longer. And so um, that device becomes more desirable. The other benefits are obviously being in the cloud, your data is being administered by someone else, not by you. It's always available. It's always secure, we're told. It's always being backed up and it's adaptable. If you need more space, you can simply purchase more space. If you need a faster um, server, you can buy a faster server or reconfigure more memory online. So those are the benefits of this thing that we're calling the cloud, cloud storage. What can connect to the cloud? Well, as I said, um, we have many diverse devices that can connect. So we have smartphones, billions of smartphones. We have laptops, notebooks, desktops and servers can connect to the cloud. They can also be in the cloud. And we'll get to what that means uh, very soon. Um, and that's, a, that's sort of a, a graphical representation of the cloud being um, everywhere and at the same time nowhere and what can connect to it. What are the disadvantages of being in the cloud? Where is your data? As I said before, if you are a medical professional or perhaps a legal professional or other, an other type of person that has legislative considerations about where your data has to be, then you need to be very careful about how you use the cloud. Very careful in how you choose your provider of cloud-based solutions, given that, as I said, at any time your data might be being mirrored, or by that term mirrored I mean maybe actually located on a server outside of your domestic location. So rather than on a data center somewhere in uh, Western Brisbane or in Melbourne, it might be in Hong Kong or your data might actually be located in Singapore and that's where you're accessing it using your internet connection. So there are some specific considerations that you need to make when you're choosing your cloud provider. Who has access to your data? So very careful from the outset as to who has access to accessing your data. Who is provided with the login and password to access your data? Keep track of that right from the start as we'll see later, these things can, once the genie is out of the bottle, it's very hard to get it back in again, if not impossible. Who can access your data? Now, obviously, you're thinking to yourself, well, it's me, but what about your provider? Can they access your data? What about the employees of your provider? Can they access your data? What assurances do you have that you might have some very interesting intellectual property being stored on the cloud? What about the person that the firm who is accessing that and administering it for you. Are they able to see it? Is it being stored in an encrypted state, which would give you some strong assurances that no one can access your data other than you? So those are the types of questions you need to ask when you're choosing your cloud provider. Who owns your data? And by this I mean once you put data in the cloud, is it still yours? And this is particularly um, an issue with regards to social media where it may not be completely clear, for example, if you use an application called Instagram, as to who owns that picture that you've put on Instagram and to what uses it can be uh, put to. So you may recall or you may not know that very recently 
um, Instagram changed their user agreement to say that anything that you put on Instagram can be used by them for a commercial purpose. Um, and there was huge protests about that and people, um, basically there was a revolution in Instagram and people were able to push to have that change that if you put something on Instagram, it's owned by you and if Instagram wishes to use it for a commercial purpose, they can't do so without your express permission. Um, and security. So in security, security again comes back to how good are the encryption and the logins and the security wrapped around your cloud provider. And, and these are important given that we're in the very early days of, of cloud technology and there are some, some actors and some players in the industry that may or may not be here in a year's time. And so where is your data going to go if they collapse? So that's a very important consideration as well. Security. So let's talk about why you should care about the cloud. Well, I've already broached the reason that we're being driven to the cloud. We're being driven to the cloud by the fact that um, there is more space available, we're told. Uh, it's more secure. It's more adaptable. It's able to be backed up. The other reason is that there's huge investment going on in the cloud. So the cloud, in terms of usability, will improve. Accessibility, it will improve, because that's where the investment is going. And we're being driven here, obviously, by overseas markets as well, by uh, adoption in the United States and, and Europe and overseas. So um, cl enterprise cloud application revenues are projected to reach 60, close to $68 billion next year. From compared to say five years ago when it would have been less than one billion, um, this year uh, about a quarter of all new business software purchases are of cloud-enabled software, with software as a service delivery being 13% of worldwide software spending. And if you now buy a license of the latest version of, of Microsoft Office, Office 365, you actually with that purchase receive an entitlement to cloud use to store your documents not on your local computer, your Word documents, your letters, um, your memos, um, you will be storing them directly to the cloud uh, using Microsoft 365. What that means is are you able to protect your brand, are you able to protect your intellectual property and be prepared for litigation in this area. So internal investigations and it's a, it's a change in the way that we investigate, store and adapt our information. So this affects us all directly now. It's not just other people that are using the cloud, we really all are. Uh, you may be using the cloud and not even know it. Cloud services are what we call inherently viral. So um, generally new users are drawn in by existing users, um, both internal and external to an organization. So it might be that, for example, most servers have a limit on um, transferring or emailing attachments of about 10 megabytes. So this is driven by um, email traffic. But in fact, you can share a file of any size over the cloud. So um, a lot of firms, a lot of um, businesses are now standardizing on a cloud application, be it, be it iCloud or Dropbox or Microsoft SkyDrive or Google, um, Google Documents or Google Drive to upload the file, which might be bigger than 10 megabytes, to the cloud-based application and simply email a link to the person they wish to share it with and they can then download it in their own time and it's always available. It's not going to be blocked by antivirus on an email exchange, for example, or exceed a size limit and it's very efficient. So if that happens at work, often that's driven then personally where people will then send family photos. We can now send hundreds of family photos to each other without worrying about our email or our, our bandwidth um, mobile apps are often called um, the gateway drug. So if, again, if you have a lot of these applications have an app that can be downloaded for free and you're given an account and you can start sharing pictures, start sharing documents, start sharing uh, any information. And again, they, uh, there's a tremendous investment in cloud-based applications now, especially in the United States. Some of the main ones that we see are Box.net, Box uh, Dropbox, um, Google Drive. So if you have a Gmail account, you're given a free um, Google Drive account of, I think, 15 gigabytes, which is a huge amount, and it's changing all the time. It's increasing all the time. Um, SkyDrive is Microsoft's product we've spoken about 
Um, iCloud, you're given five gigabytes for free um, to back up your photos or your phone or, or whatever the case may be if you have an Apple ID. And then there are hundreds of other providers as well. Uh, Amazon have a Cloud Drive application as well. They work generally the same way. Uh, you first open an account with the cloud provider. So again, this is very similar to you having an Apple ID or a Dropbox account. Um, that's how you're then known. So you open an account by giving them your contact email, usually, and a password. And it's easy as that. And then the application will install. You now have a, a cloud account. So there's generally a client application. Install that software. Um, you then allow it to sync any documents that you place into that application, pictures, files, documents, and that will then sync with any device that you access, um, you, that you use to access that, that account. All of those files are then available to you as long as they've been uploaded to the cloud. And it's, as, it's as simple as that. I've got a, an, an image here on the screen where you can see a, a Dropbox account on the left hand side. You can see a series of folders called camera uploads, and studio session, um, so forth, so forth, photos, public, thread wire, that type of thing. On the right hand side is the online cloud account and you can see the folders are exactly the same. Camera uploads, studio session, um, photos, public, all that type of thing. It's exactly the same. So anything that's moved into that, that's moved into those folders is then synchronized with what's online. And I can then access my Dropbox account if I travel I can place all my tickets on Dropbox and I can access them from the um, airport in Hong Kong and scan my barcode and, and get my ticket. So it's a very, this is a very simple example of the viral nature of Dropbox where I've used it personally, it can then be used in a commercial application for the same thing, to send clients or colleagues large files which they can access from anywhere. Here's a very simplified uh, graph. So we've got the cloud in the middle, which might be Dropbox, it might be iCloud, and all around the outside we have your mobile phone, which can access the exact same data as your office computer, which can access the exact same data as your home computer and your tablet. It's a very simple example of how that cloud-based data works. It's what we call a freemium model. So the basic service of Dropbox is actually free. Um, you can receive a two gigabyte Dropbox account for free as long as you provide them with your uh, login name and your password um, and you get rewarded. For the more people that you um, draw into Dropbox, you, that you invite to Dropbox, you get a reward of more, um, more storage. So you can earn more storage um, the more people you pull in. So not dissimilar to any other um, viral or uh, business type model where you're rewarded for the business that you bring. Um, you can upgrade that. If, you don't, if you've don't, if you outgrown the free service, you can upgrade that for about $10 or $11 a month, so it's about $110 a year, which is about the cost, maybe slightly higher, of a one terabyte hard drive. The, dip, the advantage being of your online storage never becomes obsolete, it never breaks down, um, it's never lost, um, and it's always backed up and always secure. So some big advantages there. You've then got the ability to share those files and those folders with anyone who might also be on Dropbox or not. So, you can, As I said before, you can email links to people who can then download or access those files. Um, many apps connect to it, applications connect with it, they interface with it. So if you have a secure password software, you can back it up to Dropbox. If you uh, choose to on your iPhone, you can actually back up all of the photos on your phone to Dropbox. Um, so it's very, very simple and easy to use. It keeps logs of who logs in, so if you want to see who's logged in and used the files, you can see those. You can see what versions of files you've placed on Dropbox, and you can even delete, beg your pardon, you can even recover files that have been deleted. It will do that for you. Um, so that's a very attractive option for, for many users. Um, connections are secure and encrypted. So in the initial stages of cloud technology, that was um, a huge barrier to people joining, was that a lot of the files were stored just as plain text files. So they could be um, accessed pretty easily by hackers. Um, but modern um, encryption standards now apply to most cloud applications, which is something you should check, which means that even if your account is hacked, the files are stored um, in an encrypted state, which means they can't be viewed or used unless they have access to your password. Big advantage. 
However, this brings with it more sinister applications. So if we can look at our very simple diagram on the left of the cloud data in the middle and all your employees' devices all around it, which can freely access it, and then you can see that what if they share your data, your employment data, with their home cloud, and which they can then access from their home computer and their office computer and their mobile phone. They share that with someone else, perhaps your competitor. And this is where the problem problems arise because now the genie is out of the bottle and it's unlikely that um, without expert detection and without expert assistance that you'll be able to retrieve that data, if, if ever. So these are the security concerns that you need to be more aware of. That the, advantage of the, the advantages of the cloud data being shareable mean that perhaps that's even a, a bigger disadvantage. So you need to, at the outset, have policies surrounding your cloud-based sharing applications. Even if you don't think your employees are using them, you need to have strict policies around them. So that if this type of thing happens, you're able to recover or at least have um, a policy in place to uh, deal with sharing of this data. How can you do it? Well, Dropbox is Dropbox has had a huge amount of investment within it. So it will now install even if the user is not an administrator of a computer. So um, a strict control around software and viruses, really an antivirus pre prevention method, has been that users at a, at a network, for example, or, or an office, were called standard users. I mean, they couldn't install any software. They could only use what's there now. Um, Dropbox will, in fact, install on a computer if you're not an administrator. So that's a big, a big workaround for Dropbox, again, with regards to its viral nature. It's able to get in anyway. If one user on that network is able to connect to Dropbox, basically there's a, there's a window to connect out to the cloud, then all of the Dropboxes on that network will then connect through that user. So it's called a land sync exercise, and not many people are aware of that. So it might be that they'll give their uh, IT administrator Dropbox access, thinking that um, you know that's a good security measure. But in fact, other users can then install Dropbox on their computer and connect through that other account. So it's a uh, a big uh, a big concern for security professionals. So moving on to iCloud, which essentially works the same way um, as Dropbox and those principles that we spoke about. So Basically, Apple says to us, set up iCloud on all your devices, the rest is automatic. Fantastic. So all of your data is shared on all your devices. You need to consider whether you want that to happen or not. What it means for colleagues, for employees, for family members, that all your data is flying around all the time on all your devices. So concerns here being, well, I might have my phone in my pocket, that's fine, but what about that computer that's sitting at home? Who's accessing that? What about the, uh, the computer that I used to have at my work and I actually logged into iCloud on that? Who's accessing that? So you need to have those concerns front of mind all the time. Because despite what um, Steve Jobs, Tim Cook, Bono, Apple is not your friend. They don't know who you are. They only know your Apple ID. That's all they know. They have an Apple ID which might be user at hotmail.com, user at outlook.com, whatever it is. They use your Apple ID to sync your content between those devices. So um, you may not even know what your Apple ID is. You may have set it up on your new phone four years ago when you got your new iPhone. Um, but I can assure you that's how Apple knows you as your Apple ID. It's the key to synchronizing your content between devices. All, so all the information is filed according to your Apple ID, including your uh, password. Um, most users would be using an email address as their Apple ID. So it's not necessarily your name, it's your email address. So an old email address from Hotmail that you don't use anymore, or perhaps you had um, your Apple ID was set up when you had a phone at your former employer, that can be a dead end in terms of if you ever need to recover your data or um, share your data, it's actually um, um, with a former employer. So if you send a password recovery email, it won't come to you at your new work, it'll come to your old email address because that's what you gave them when you signed on for your Apple ID. So have that front of mind as well when you're, when you're thinking about sharing personal data on a work email account. 
So by entering your Apple ID to a device, you're essentially logging in. You're basically identifying yourself as that device being you. You're logging into the Apple network, which is storing your photos and your apps and your eHarmony account and all that type of thing. So depending on your settings, your content will want to sync with your Apple account, sync being synchronized. So your calendars, your pictures, your songs, your notes, and whatever else you've chosen. So if you've taken photos on your iPhone, that will sync across all your devices and be available to people. So, and this this is set out on the, this is a screenshot from the Apple website. So an Apple ID is the login you use for just about everything to do with Apple. So they're basically telling you here. Um, what you need to know is at the bottom of the screen it says forgotten Apple ID password. So if you click on that, if you've forgotten your password and you click on that, it will try to send a recovery email to the email address that you specified. And this is when I was referring to before about a recovery address. If that's a former work address or a, a dead um, webmail account that you had back when you were traveling overseas, you may never get your data back from Apple. So if you can't remember your password, um, you have big security concerns. So another drawback of the cloud is if you lose your identity, you lose your data. And that's set out on this slide. So problems arise when a user has multiple devices and multiple Apple IDs. So you got a new phone, you couldn't remember your ID, so you're logged in with a new Apple ID, which Apple will readily give you. Um, it doesn't know that it's the same person, it just sees a different Apple ID. Um, so your ID is lost when the password and the username are lost. Content might be syncing to devices where this is not desired. So if you have an iPad, and a phone, um, your content might be syncing, so messages might be popping up on an iPad that you've given to an employee, for example, which you may not want. So check which applications have access to your data, and uh, anecdotally speaking, you do own your photos and your notes and original thoughts, but you're only renting that music that you purchased from Apple. So if you've purchased a whole heap of uh, songs from Apple, they don't die with you, they go back to Apple. So it's something uh, that people weren't aware of and there might be issues that haven't been explored in terms of who owns our data and what happens when we uh, are no longer here, what happens to all of our data. So sharing. Use your Apple ID, you can choose to share content via the iCloud and that might be photos, videos, uh, application data, so documents, spreadsheets, status updates and you choose who to share with and what content to share in your stream. So you can actually only share it with a partner or spouse or only share it with work colleagues, but you need to tell the application, be it iCloud or Dropbox, that that's what you want to happen. You need to take control of it and not just trust the application to do what you want. You need to tell it what to do. Passwords, they do need to be secure. Passwords need to be long. The longer the better. They need to be fairly random and written down somewhere. Um, the fact is a piece of paper in your drawer is probably not good enough, but write all your passwords on a piece of paper and give it to a trusted person, which is uh, you know, a very uh, basic way of remembering your passwords. Give it to someone else, but it needs to be trusted. So it's especially important if you have moved around a lot or if you no longer have your recovery address to make sure that you know what your passwords are, because if you lose your ID, you lose your data. Very important to remember that. Check your Apple ID settings and include a rescue address. So that means a separate email address rather than the one you've already given Apple. So it might, again, it might be your partner, it might be a trusted person or a family member, so that when you tell Apple you've forgotten your password, it sends an email to two places to reset the link. It's called a rescue address. Um, Two-factor authentication means it may also send a code to another device, perhaps a phone or, or a computer, saying enter this code to reset your password. Um, so again, it prevents um, an outside person hacking your account because they won't receive that code. Um, it will arrive on a device that you choose and that way your password can't be changed without your knowledge. So Apple's own operating system handles all your devices in iTunes. Um, and iTunes is also free for computers running other operating systems. So Windows, you can install iTunes and back up your devices and, and handle your Apple IDs. 
Um, check your iCloud settings for what's being backed up and synced. It doesn't always have to be all of your photos being backed up and synchronized. You can choose what to be synchronized. Um, if you don't want your photos popping up on your children's iPad uh, or messages, then I suggest you check your iCloud settings. And I always back up to my local device, so I keep a backup of my um, devices locally, which means on the computer that I'm using. For example, if I'm backing up my phone, I'll, I'll back that up to my local computer. And I would also recommend choosing the option to encrypt the backup, and this provides extra security. So if you back up your phone to a work computer and then leave that employment um, so that your backup isn't being stored there for anyone to access, uh, choose the encryption. Extra security is important. Um, use caution when sharing data. Don't share data that you wouldn't um, want anyone to have access to if you don't think your passwords are very secure, for example. Be aware that other devices using your Apple ID will receive your SMSs, they'll receive your emails, your shared pictures, um, and that becomes painfully obvious uh, once um, perhaps a, a former spouse um, accesses data that you don't wish, or private data, um, it's a bit late then to change your Apple ID, but that's what can happen. And be prepared to access your children's Apple ID um, if you feel they're vulnerable. Um, it might be that they need help with their security as well and with their uh, policies regarding uh, photo sharing, access to social media and that type of thing. That's very important. Turn in Apple, again if you have an Apple device, turn on the Find My iPhone. Um, it's installed by default on all um, modern, or sorry, later um, Apple installations. It lets you locate your device if it's lost, including you can you can make the device beep if you can't find it in your house, or if you've lost it um, on transit somewhere, you can place a useful contact message on the screen, call me at this number, and worst comes to worst, you can actually completely wipe the device so it's not usable, especially if it's stolen. So find my iPhone is very important for, for this type of thing. So data in the cloud, do we embrace it, do we block it? Um, you need to be confident that you have um, a successful or a strong policy in place for all users regarding sharing data because I've not um, met a client yet or a security professional, security IT professional yet that's been able to block any of these services. They're extremely clever in getting around any type of attempts to block them. It's an immediate concern. Um, it's not going to happen in, in future. You don't want to be dealing this once it's happened because as I said, once the genie's out of the bottle, it's too late. So you need to be onto this right now. Trying to block them is uh, you're basically starting a fight that you can't win. Um, you're not going to be able to block cloud sharing, data sharing apps. They're here already. They've been in place for too long already. Um, you need another approach, and that's a strong policy. The challenge, as we've already noted, the challenge is that you've got software inside your network. It wants to interact with servers outside your network, and it has very good methods for doing so. Um, most um, previous methods of, of blocking these types of things no longer work. So we use the example of, of SSL interception, um, the, which is a very strong way of, of beating former methods to block them. Dropbox is very strong in this department. So we've already talked about former methods um, to block it. It's a race you can't win. Um, you need to have policies in place. Most of the major cloud services have mobile device apps um, and use them heavily. Installation of a mobile app is a good indicator of active use rather than a passing interest. So if employees or colleagues have Dropbox on their phone uh, for whatever reason, um, you can be sure that they're very au fait with their use and um, they're using it already. It's a strong indicator that they are using cloud-based apps. So you need to have perhaps a method of monitoring that use or again, a strong policy in place. Users might be using uh, cloud-based apps and not be aware of it. It's possible that certain services to sign up another person without their consent. So again, by someone clicking on a link in Dropbox, it then offers that it has captures their email address. It offers them their own account. Ask you know if they want to use it. There are rewards for using these types of apps. So it it increases that viral nature of them. Um, users might argue that that their access was sanctioned because, well, I know the directors are using Dropbox, why can't I use it? Um, well, the clients 
uh, use Salesforce, I need to be using Salesforce as well. So that type of thing. I need to be up to date on this technology is, is a good rationalization for this type of thing. If you're thinking about blocking one cloud-based app, um, you can see from this slide that there are far more cloud-based apps than we can even fit uh, in PowerPoint. So there's all types of content creation applications, um, collaboration for teams, especially Evernote, which is which is a big one for this now. Um, data storage is probably the main method uh, that people become involved with cloud applications, especially Dropbox, um, SkyDrive, um, which is the Microsoft one, uh, Google Drive, and iCloud. So again, it, just blocking one of these isn't good enough. Now, in terms of other uh, cloud-based technology, perhaps a topic for another session, software as a service that I mentioned before is simply using uh, software in the cloud to access an application such as email or an application such as um, tracking sales or um, you know, um, client collaboration, that type of thing. M most of us would be using software as a service in our um, you know, web-based lives. Uh, if you have a Gmail account, for example, you, you're using software as a service. Platform as a service is the next level up, which is where you're accessing a suite of applications that have been provided to you, um, perhaps using the Microsoft Azure platform, which will give you access to email, access to Microsoft Office, Outlook, and any other products that you like that are placed there for you to access and use. So it's a suite of applications, uh, obviously a platform. Infrastructure as a service is where you're provided with a blank space on the web that you can populate with your own servers, your own applications, and use it any way that you feel. So it's generally for um, an IT, a solid IT function would be where you're simply loading it up with your own infrastructure, servers, and what have you. And they're the three different levels. Software as a service, simply a, a paper use type application. Uh, platform as a service, which is uh, the next step up, a bit more complicated, a suite of applications, and infrastructure as a service where you're, you have all of your computer infrastructure on the web, in the cloud, and you access it um, using perhaps tablets, phones, or computers through the internet. Uh, finally, uh, look, my best advice is to use the services that we've talked about so that you're familiar with them. You can be sure that your employees and your colleagues and your family members are already using them. Um, so to protect your intellectual property, assume that current blocking methods aren't going to work. Focus on awareness, focus on policy enforcement and detection, and focus on prevention so the genie can't get out of the bottle. Start to plan now for dealing with online data in your life, particularly structuring policy issues and advice to clients and colleagues around methods of data access, methods of data sharing, and in my case, methods of evidence collection. So I've gone over time. Uh, thank you all for attending the webinar. Um, I really appreciate it. Look, if you do have any questions, feel free to contact me at Vincent's, um, dhaines at vincents.com.au or on our social media pages, which uh, we're on Facebook and we're on Twitter. Um, so thank you very much. I hope this has been useful.